Welcome, welcome everyone. This is Carmen Bowman with the Wyoming Culture Change Coalition online March Madness Culture Change Conference. Woohoo! This is our second conference session, and I am so thrilled you are here linking person directed dining with employee satisfaction and retention. And it is my honor, truly, everyone, to introduce you to a friend and colleague, uh, Suzanne Queering. And let me tell you a little bit about her. Oh, I'm very excited to tell you. She is. She knows what she's doing. Suzanne is a registered dietitian, both in Canada and the U.S. She's a member of Dietitians of Canada, Washington State Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and Dietetics and Healthcare Communities. She's a certified dietary manager as well with the, with the Academy of Nutrition and Food Professionals. Um, she has a two-year continuing care administrator's diploma and 30 years experience in healthcare community food service. She's been, you know, everything, a director of food services, dietitian, and consultant. She's personally worked in all areas of residential care from assisted living to nursing home, palliative, dementia, brain injury, extended care, acute care. And she has an appreciation, everyone, this is the best part, to the practical and real challenges of providing great meal service to residents, regardless of their care level. She also works currently two days a week as a clinical dietitian. In 2000, Susan, Suzanne and your husband, right, <laughs> invented the Suzy Q cart system. This is um, a hot food cart that she's going to tell us about, everyone. I've given her permission. We're not, uh, we haven't applied for CEU, so it's one of those moments in time where an inventor can actually tell us about the cool thing that they invented. So just so you know, I've invited Suzanne to do that. Um, this hot food cart presents a lot of wonderful um, practices. You can interact with residents. You can give them choice. They get hotter food and your home wastes less food. Uh, you'll hear all about that. She's helped get this over 1,000 communities throughout all of North America improve the dining experience for both residents and those serving them with what they call mobile meal service. Um, Suzanne has been published in 10 peer publications. She's a speaker at all sorts of regional, national healthcare conferences. She got a special award, Marie Taylor Award for Excellence in Long-Term Care by the Dietitians of Canada in 2015. Also the National Dining Distinction Award winner 2020 with ANFP, that's the Oh, I think Association, Association. Yeah. Nutrition yeah. and Food Professionals. I said Academy before, I'm sorry. And she is active with um, something in Canada called the Research Institute of Aging Choices Plus program. And it sounds like you were recently published in, in a Canadian journal of aging regarding COVID and dining practices. Congrats, Suzanne. So voila, everyone. You can see why I've invited her to share and teach and for you to be able to um, ask her lots of questions. Just to remind everyone, Suzanne will do 45 minutes of content and then we get 15 minutes of question and answer. And then we'll take a break, 15 minutes, and do that again. So, welcome and, and Wyoming, she's all yours. <laughs> Thank Great. you, Suzanne. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Carmen. And hello, everybody. Um, just some housekeeping items is um, I actually did have COVID. Um, four weeks ago. So I have one of those post long COVID coughs. So if I have a cough fit, just be gracious with me <laughs> as I get over that. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited to share with you. I'm a very practical dietitian. So I'm really hoping that I can really come um, to this session and really give you a whole bunch of ideas. Um, and so my hope really is to challenge you and encourage you in regards to common practice when it comes to food service delivery. And what I'm going to be talking about is a different way of thinking about meal service as a whole. So we want to increase staff satisfaction and retention. And let's throw COVID into this crazy mix as well. And how do we do that if we hadn't already burnt out everybody? So, um, so I'm going to be talking about culture shift, leadership, and really need to come with a very open mind. And I really hope you're ready to learn with me today. So as Carmen talked about, I'm going to talk um, from 2 to 2.45, 45 minutes. 
um, with content. Let's have some Q&A time because you all come from different communities and probably have lots of different questions. Then let's have a break um, and then we'll come back and uh, another 45 minutes. And then I really want to spend time um, allowing you to come up with your plan. And I know that there's a lot of million things that you probably need to get done at your community, um, staffing and ordering and yada, yada. But I really feel that this presentation, you will get a lot out of it. Um, I'm really pulling from my 30 years of experience and um, hope to just encourage you with some really practical ideas. So, but... First of all, I think we really need to appreciate that we all work in different communities and all different settings. So how many dining rooms do you have? How, what are your staff like? What's your leadership support like? What type of care do you provide? So you have to um, appreciate that everybody does come from lots of different um, settings. Um, so I'm gonna be sharing little nuggets of practical ideas and you get to pick and choose what you wanna learn from. Um, a lot of resources, a lot of ideas, and really challenge you with the status quo of what typically is done um, at healthcare food services. Oh, and then let's throw COVID into the situation, like I said before. So some of the photos that you will see in this presentation were before COVID, but the point of the photo is still there. You just now need to imagine um, staff with masks on. Um, so we have all of us, the fact that you showed up today shows me that you have a shared goal of amazing meal service for our elders. And I congratulate you on that. So let's, um, let's, let's go ahead and sort of see what we're going to talk about. So a positive dining experience, like what does that mean? And why does it even matter? And why should you care? And isn't the dining room just a place to eat? And this is actually a really, really important question um, to think about, like really think about a positive dining experience. Why do you even care about it? And actually what's really interesting is when I've asked a lot of managers who work in residential care these three questions, the variety of um, feedback is incredible. So I want to ask you this right now. So hopefully you have a little piece of paper and pen next to you and you can answer these questions because we're going to come back to these questions and I want you to see what your, um, your answers were. So the first one is what would you give your current dining experience score on a scale of one to 10? So one being terrible and 10 being amazing, like it's excellent. There is nothing to change. It's absolutely perfect. What would you give your score? So you don't have to share that with me, but just to be honest and authentic with yourself, what is that number and why is it that number? The second thing is what are the top frustrations with your meal service experience? Like, what is it that bugs you? Like, what is it like, you're, you're just not that, it's just not that as awesome as it could be. What is that? And then the third question is, what do you think are the top desires of residents, elders, villagers, um, whomever you, whatever term you would like to use regarding meal service? And what about family members? And what about the staff? What do you think their top desires for the residents are regarding meal service? And how often do you ask them? And when do you ask them? So really, these are really, three really excellent questions that you can also use in a learning circle, which I will talk about later on. Okay, so I'm going to share with you my journey. Uh, my journey began at Pleasant View Care Home. Um, I was the frustrated director of support services. So I was in charge of food service and laundry and housekeeping and maintenance. And I was the clinical dietitian. So a busy, busy job, um, but um, it was 76 um, residents that lived there. And this is how we did meal service. So we were in the back of the house, um, in the kitchen. There was a steam table at the back. Um, my staff would dish up plates of food, put it up here on the shelf. Um, and then we would also send trays of food down to the wings. Um, many, many challenges. This is how I felt. I felt frustrated. Oh, we had so many lists. I couldn't even keep track of everything. We had a juice sheet. We had a cereal sheet. We had um, sheet, sheet, sheets, and more sheets. Um, 
we everything was pre-poured. Um, the food service team were really in the four walls of the kitchen and very disconnected with what was going on at the front of the house. Um, there was really poor teamwork between the nursing team and the kitchen team. They were all very upset with each other. High food waste. It didn't feel normal. It felt very institutional. I knew that this is not how I ate at home or how my family ate at home. Um, I also had poor men's support. I never, ever saw my DOC or my administrator in the dining room. So kind of missing an action. So I felt like they really didn't understand what I was struggling with. Updating the likes and dislikes preference list, lack of choice, cold food. Uh, my food service team really did not know their residents very well. Um, and they never really went out there to talk to them and high staff turnover. So um, I don't know if any of you can relate to any of the, this list that I had, <laughs> but, um, you know, this is what, how I was feeling. And I went on a journey to find a better way. And I did. And my administrator, Judith, actually came to me two years later and said, Suzanne, like literally it has been transformed at our community. Can you please write what you did? And it got published in the Journal of Gerontology and Nursing. And the question was, what methods do you use to make mealtime a pleasurable but efficient experience in your setting? So this is what I wrote. Here's my name right there. Of course, this is before the internet um, and people use the good old phone and they would phone me um, using the yellow pages. <laughs> Um, called me and said, can you teach me what you did and how do I get set up? And I really, it really just started a movement in food service. And uh, as Carmen said, I've helped over a thousand communities um, implement, um, you know, some of these practices. So what I did at preparing for this presentation is I really kind of sat back and I thought of a top 10. I know we all like top 10 lists. So I thought I would come up with a top 10 list of ideas to help support you at making your dining experience as amazing as it can be. So we're going to go through tips one to four, then we're going to have a break, and then I'm going to go through um, tips five to ten. So that's my landscape with you. So the first one is know and lean on research best practices really to, to lead your way and flood others with it. Teach with it and share it with your team and get current. Um, Maya Angelou says, this is a really classic quote, do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, you do better. So my question is, are you up to date with what best practices is when it comes to food service practices in residential care? And when you do a literature review and you know, here's a whole bunch of, of um, different references, but really what it is telling us as dietitians is that malnutrition is a super well-documented clinical issue in residential care. We know that the prevalence of malnutrition in adults admitted to hospital who stay more than two days is 45%. Um, as clinical dietitians, we really struggle with getting um, the PO intake as maximized as possible in the healthcare setting. And in 2011, it's a little old now, but it's what the best we got right now is the Pioneer Network Dining Standards, which I'm sure all of you have a copy of, and if you don't, you should, um, is that it found that 50 to 70% of residents leave 25% or more of their food uneaten, that there's a lot of dietary supplement use, 25% um, of residents experience weight loss when research staff conducted um, weighting weights. And so the, when you look at the literature, the malnutrition prevalence is anywhere between 23% to 85%, big range, but what it's saying it's at least 23%. Um, and so when folks are malnourished, we have a whole other slew of issues that come with that, everything from quality of life and deep increased function to mortality and morbidity, as well as increased hospital stays and pressure sores. And, you know, the list is long. So as a dietitian, we are constantly working at trying to get our folks to be well nourished. Bottom line. So food is only nourishing if people eat it. So here's the question. Why aren't they eating it? 
And that is, the, that is the, you know, the big ticket, golden ticket question is why are they not eating the food? And so we need to kind of understand that. So this, the, there's, some, there's three key pieces of literature I want you to know. The first one is the position paper by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So this is, this is the association that us as dietitians in the US, we belong to this. And they came up with a position paper. And it basically is saying we have to use least restrictive diets. We do not want to see low sodium, diabetic, low fat diets in residential care. Because what we want to do is we want to make quality of life and their right to make choices in daily living a priority over improving their health and increasing longevity. Okay, so that's kind of the first one. We want to maintain quality of life and maintenance of health. The second one is the Pioneer Network Dining Standards, which I showed you before. So this document really was um, a landmark document. Like it rocked my world as a dietitian because this, was a, this is a document that 12 professional groups stand behind. Everything from doctors to doctors, to SLPs, to nurses, all the associations stand behind this. And what it's basically saying to us is, is that um, food and dining are an integral part of individualized care and self-directed living. So the importance that food and dining has on, it has a significant element of daily living. And the most frequent questions, listen to this, the most frequent questions received by regulators and providers consistently focuses on food and food policies and dining in homes. So, so... This is the area that we need the most conversation in. This is important because it really filters through everybody's um, work world at a community. So if we really want to improve quality of life for folks in residential care, we must really put an emphasis on food service. I don't know if I can be super more clear than that, but <laughs> it's as clear as I can. And so um, what the Pioneer Network Dining Standards really has, and I use this all the time, I teach with it all the time, please get a copy of it, it's free, you just go to the Pioneer Network website, you can download it, put it in a binder, and it really goes through all these chapters about, you know, should we be using a low sodium diet or a cardiac diet, should we be focusing on real food first, honoring choices and self directed living, and it's all research based. So these, this isn't just made up stuff, this is best practices. So the Pioneer Network also has lots and lots of really good resources to allow you to also teach with, um, tip sheets and exercises and all that sort of stuff. So highly encourage you to um, check that out. Um, the other thing they did, which I really liked is they actually came up with brochures that you can put in your community for family members and um, the elders to have that says you have the right to choose, you have the right to eat real food and you do have the right to an unrestricted diet. And um, those can be really handy. And then um, the third resource that I really like using is all the culture change resources that are out there. And many of them, there's lots of free um, webinars, newsletters, courses, conference topics, that sort of thing. So I, these are the ones I use, I get them into my inbox. And it really helps um, push my practice to make sure that it's um, as evident based and current as possible. So um, Eat an Alternative, there's their website, Leading Age, Pioneer Network, the Butterfly Household Model of Care, and the Research Institute of Aging. So those are five that I like. If you're tapped into those, then you're going to be um, right on your way. Okay, so some resources there as well. So that's number one, best practices, really get current. The second one, second tip that I have for you is to follow the food from start to finish. And what do you see and what do you learn? And so I'm not saying a quick 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Um, I really want to encourage you to follow it right from the time it leaves the kitchen to the time that tray or plate or whatever comes back to the kitchen at the end of meal service. Um, what did you learn in the process? So I really um, want to encourage you to pick up a coffee pot and get out of your office at least two to three times a week 
and come alongside the staff and circulate with the coffee pot. And it's fun and you get your eyes on what's going on um, and you're connecting with not just the staff, but also um, the elders and you're pushing hydration and you are connecting. And I think that when you're doing that, you're also seeing what's really going on. Let's be honest. Um, you can see how, how does the dining room feel? How is the connection? How is the choices? How is, from your point of view, how is that doing? And I would also encourage you to maybe consider even having a meal in the dining room, set up beside um, an elder and ask and have lunch with them and watch it for an hour. And also what about your DOC, DON administrator? Do you ever see them? Um, I want to tell you a story that at one community that I was at, um, I actually put our admin team on a coffee serving schedule. So my DON always had Mondays where she would be in the dining room. Uh, my administrator was Tuesday. I was Wednesday. The activity coordinator was Thursday. And the accountant was Friday. Can you imagine the accountant <laughs> coming out? But you know what? I mean, he's the one paying all the food bills. So why can't he come out of his office for an hour once a week and actually just see what's really going on? And what happens, what happens is, is that you get your admin team really um, on board with what's going on in the dining room, but they're also then connecting with, with the residents and with the staff. Um, and that speaks volumes. They're not just serving coffee. That's just your tool to get the job done. Um, so getting your leadership to buy into that and support is really helpful. And if you don't have their support, it really can fall down. Um, and be direct and ask. Um, if they're not understanding what the issues are, they can't help. So let's follow the food. So let's go to this community. Um, they had tray service and it was um, 150 um, folks lived in this home. Um, they had three separate dining rooms and the menu board that day that I was there was said split pea soup, ham and cheese sandwich and ice cream. Really basic, but that's what it said. Um, but I watched meal service. So this is me taking photos of the food. So it's coming down from the kitchen. Um, you know, the trays of all, tray lines done it all accurate, right? <laughs> Reading lists. But I pull out one of the trays and I think to myself, can an 80 year old senior actually eat and drink all of this? Like, let, just look at the fluid alone. I mean, it's, it's a horrendous amount of fluid. And it's also incredibly institutional looking. You and I do not eat like this in our own homes. We don't. I don't understand why we do this in residential care. I have no idea to this day. I still have no idea why we do it this way. Um, and what I am encouraged with is I'm seeing more and more homes go away from this. I get that maybe this works if you're in a acute care hospital in ICU and you're in there for two, three days and then you're gonna go home, but not in a residential care community where this is your last postal code, like this is where your, your zip code is. Why are we serving this way? This is not normal and this is institutional and that must end, <laughs> it really must. But what was interesting was is that after the trays were passed out and the, um, the folks were given like 30, 40 minutes to eat, the trays are then picked up and put back in the slots. And I thought, you know, I'm going to go through those trays. I'm going to see what actually is actually consumed. And this is just two of the trays. And so it makes me think, did this um, gentleman really want the soup? Did he want the bread? Did he want the ice cream? Did he want peanut butter? Was this meal too big? How about this, this one here? And so actually what I did was I went through all 42 trays. I pulled some tables together. Those are my keys. That's my pen and paper. And I went through and I took off all the food that was three quarters or more not consumed. And I put a dollar value on it. And I thought, let's say this is about $40 worth of wasted food that's going to go in the disposal. I think it's more than that, but let's just say $40. What if it was 150 residents, not just the 42, because there was 150 folks that lived in this community. What if it was three meals a day? What if it was 365 days a year? We could guesstimate that $156,000 was going down the drain a year. Folks, this is where your money is. 
to make positive change. I know we don't have a lot of money in residential care. I get that. But we are throwing out so much money. So um, did this community change? Yes, they did. But you have to make a case for it. You have to show the decision makers. And actually, we have known by research back in 1997 that tray service um, co does cost more, mill acceptability is less, and the quantity of resources required is more. So it's already, we already have been told this by research that it doesn't work, but we still do it. Because I don't know if people know there's a different way, and that's why I want to teach you. So a second way is the survey system. Um, people call it neighborhoods or pods. I uh, hate that term pod, by the way. Um, they'll call it restaurant style, but really what we're doing is we're pre-plating. So um, this is, um, um, you can imagine this is in a dining room. The food service team are standing behind here. The care team has um, come along here. They pick up plates of food and off they, they run. So this is another community, same thing where the, you have a, cook here, you have a staff member picking up plates of food here, and I call it the throw and go method because we are literally just running back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with plates of food um, and dropping and going and dropping and going. And we're not talking, we're not really offering true choice um, in the conversation. This is another community, same thing. You have the food service staff here, one, two, three. And on the other side of the wall, you have um, three nursing staff members here. And they're talking to themselves and nobody is talking to the residents. And I call this blah, 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 blah. It is so boring for the, do, don't these residents look bored? They look so bored. And really what it comes down to is actually I had a chef say to me, they said, actually what's happening is, is that there's no show. You know, they're bored because there's no show. Where's the show? And if you think about when you go to a restaurant, you know, the open kitchens and you see, you know, you've probably even gone to a restaurant where they do the cooking right in front of you. Um, it's kind of fun. It's the show behind it. When you have pre-plate, when you have tray service and everything is done for you, there's no show and it's boring. And I really want you to think about that. So really look at how is your food waste, take photos of it, put a dollar amount on it and make a case for change and really show it to your decision makers and educate them because this is where your money is for positive change. And there's a way to do it better and to find it. And that's uh, what I felt I have done. Um, and I'm gonna teach you about that. So that's number two, tip number two. How's my time? Okay, we're doing good. Um, okay, number three, an anonymous, anonymous dining experience survey. So what would your customers give your dining experience score out of one to 10? Um, do you know what the top frustrations are in the dining room from their perspective? And how do you really know? And how often do you do that anonymous dining experience survey? And what system do you have in place to collect that really valuable information? What are the top desires of your residents and family members? And if it's anonymous, it will be honest. So an idea might be, I mean, everyone has email now and most family members will give um, a community their email address is actually do a survey monkey and email it out and um, share those results and post them and make decisions um, going forward from those results. So how can you be person-centered with your dining service if you don't know what the real issues are? That's my question to you. So a recent poll done by the Senior Dining Association showed that only 55% of communities actually do resident surveys. So I think we could do better as an industry in this, in this area. So I just really want to encourage you with that. So at the beginning of this presentation, I talked to you about, you know, giving your dining experience a score of one to 10. The average score from communities that I've surveyed, and here's just from 500 different communities, um, the average score was 5.4. Not great. It's not six, seven, eight, nine, or 10. So if it's not a nine or a 10, please be open to some of these ideas that I'm going to share with you because it really starts with you being the strongest advocate in the dining room for your, um, for your folks that you serve. 
So 5.4, I've even had people say it's a one, it's a two. It's really not that good. And why is that? Like, what are the top frustrations? So this is what I hear all the time. And I work with communities all across North America. These are the top five, cold food, high food wastage, updating the likes and dislikes list, poor customer service piece to the residents and the poor interaction with them directly and the lack of choice. Those are the five. So if we can improve these five things, I'm sure you would be at a nine or a 10. What are the top desires of residents? They want choice. So what does choice mean? Does choice mean um, 20 different things to pick from for lunch? No. Think about in your own home and when you serve your own family. Um, you know, if you're serving them dinner, are you going to offer there them? Only one gray, um, Sorry, I got someone. I can't tell if you or Matt accepted, but only one of you accepted this. And then this way, I'm going to just mute somebody um, here. I haven't seen that here yet. So. <laughs> he, has he put it now? Sorry. Can you still hear me, Carmen? Yes. Okay. Um, so, sorry about that. Oh. Um, so when I'm talking about choice, what I'm talking about, like I said, is not 20 different things. I'm saying within a set menu, do you have the ability to say if you want double portions, if you want gravy on the side, if you want double scoops of mashed potatoes, do you want a small portion, large portion? That is what choice means. It doesn't mean lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of things. And I think sometimes in our industry, we've gotten that wrong a little bit. Um, we want the proper temperature of food. So we want hot foods hot, cold food cold. And we want, sometimes we want large amount of food and sometimes we don't. Um, we want to be shown dignity and respect by communicating directly with um, our elders. Um, and talk to them even if th you think they're too confused to make a decision. It is amazing how residents can make a decision when you get creative with your communication style. So it's not just, you know, maybe how you're saying the question needs to be rephrased. Maybe it's a yes or no answer. Maybe it's by show plates. Maybe it's by pointing. Maybe it's really watching the body language. It is amazing. And I can't tell you how many times um, staff go, well, you know what? They're just too confused to make a decision. I just know them. I just know what they want. And I, I say, no, that's not true. That's not fair. And that is not your job. You cannot take that fundamental right away from an individual to take the choice away from them. That is not your job. Your job is to prepare good food and offer good food. It is solely a resident's role to decide if they want it and how much. And unfortunately, that has gotten really muddy in our industry. And so if you have offered and presented a choice to a resident and you are getting nothing, then make an educated decision, sure. But that should never be the go-to first. So um, I'm very passionate about that. <laughs> um, I get very upset when I see staff making decisions on behalf of residents because they just know them and that is not right, it's not fair. So, and that brings me to number five, don't decide for me. So that's kind of number three. And then my last one before we do some Q&A time together is really shifting from predetermined to self-determined meal service, which is much more relationship centered. So we all like choices. So here's some ideas. Try a beverage cart with at least three um, beverage choices on it. Try a mobile food cart, which I'll show you what that can look like. Try a soup cart with crock pots and biscuits and buns. And, you know, we can get creative with breadsticks and cheese buns and biscuits and oh, lots of fun ways there. We can try a dessert cart, um, action station in the dining room where we cook some pancakes in front of um, residents and we get them involved and they're looking and we're having conversation kind of like when you go to a fancy hotel and you go to the omelet bar right and they make your omelet in front of you um, you can do a pie buffet fondues you can get some fun snack theme carts going these are much more interesting and you get better satisfaction results the food tends to be hotter you get less food waste which means you save money so 
here are some photos that showed up on LinkedIn when COVID first um, hit in the industry. Um, so you can see everyone has masks on. And what struck me was is that on these LinkedIn posts is that these communities were so proud of themselves for doing these carts. You know, they went around with coffee and some snacks or they got a pineapple smoothie cart going. And I'm like, uh, we've been doing this for 20 years. 20 years. Why, why are you stopping just with this? Like, like, okay, good that you did this, but you know, folks, we've been doing mobile meal service for a long, long time. Like, it's like you finally got on the train. I felt like screaming at them. And then I wanted to also keep saying, and keep going and keep going. <laughs> so, you know, this is fun, but I, I, it shows you an example of what you can keep doing. And then I also saw people getting excited about, oh, because residents were locked in their rooms with COVID. That's a whole other topic, but um, you know, getting creative with ice cream carts. And I thought, wow, they got creative with some cardboard and um, colors, and this is so fun, and this is great. This is actually a Suzy Q cart um, converted into like a ice cream social um, during um, uh, snack time. So it's versatile, but I'll share that with you. But you know, if we can do this, if we can really bring self determination choices to folks this way we can do it with our food. So it's really moving away from this predetermined, you can see the cook decided how many sandwich quarters, they, how much salad, they even put the salad dressing on the salad that resident didn't even get a choice of what salad dressing they wanted, or they get tray service. This is what predetermined choices look, at, look like, and this is not helpful. What you want to do is you want to move away, move towards mobile meal service. And so it's actually similar to being on an airplane. When uh, the airline stewardess comes down, she's not reading a sheet going, oh, Suzanne Quiring, you are sitting in row seven, seat B, and it says when you booked your flight that you like orange juice. Okay, I give you orange juice. <laughs> no, she actually just looks at me in the eyes and she said, ask me what I would like to drink. And I actually have no idea. I think, hmm, do I want cranberry juice? Do I want apple juice? Do I want orange juice? Do I want tea? Do I want coffee? Do I want just some water? Like, and it's an activity. It's an activity to make this decision. It's getting my brain thinking. And it's kind of fun because I'm bored sitting in that plane. Well, if we can do that 30,000 feet in the sky, we surely can do that in our dining rooms. Um, and when you're involved in the decision-making process, you are more inclined to drink it or eat it. And guess what? The staff have fun with it and it, it's retention. And this does not require more staffing hours. It doesn't. It's just reorganizing the hands on deck and what we're doing. Okay. So here's, here's what beverage service can look like. So it's getting a cart like this. All of us have these carts in our communities. And it's just putting some clear jugs of juice because sometimes residents know the color, but they forget the name of that red, that red juice I like, um, or the orange one, or you know, point to more tea and coffee. And guess what? Instead of the nursing staff passing trays or standing at that table um, waiting for pre-plated things, they're not going to be running back and forth anymore. You can give them the task of going around with fluids and they they might go well that's food services job that's not nursing's role and I say no that's not true because when our folks are well hydrated there's less UTIs better skin integrity um, we don't have issues with constipation as much these are all nursing issues when um, our folks are not well hydrated so of course it is so again, we're all on the same team. And we talked about before how food service is, uh, should be our home's priority. So it is everybody's job. Um, so if you need any help in that department, just reach out to me. I got lots of ammunition there to help you. So if, uh, if, you are, if your home is doing this, which is pre-pouring juice and milk, milk, sitting there for half an hour or an hour before meal service so it's warm, if you are doing this, this is not best practice. You need to move away from this. This is not good. You should be moving towards mobile meal service and really involving our folks with what they would like to um, drink. And you can do this with cereal too. 
So I don't know about your cereal cupboard at home, but you probably have more than one choice of cereal in your cupboard. Our house, I think, honestly, I think there's about seven boxes of cereal open all at one time. And, you know, what my husband eats and what my kids eat and what I eat, we all have different choices, but, you know, it can vary. So why is it not the same in residential homes as well? Sometimes I like oatmeal. Sometimes I do like Raisin Bran. Sometimes I like Rice Krispies. Um, sliced bananas on the side to put on top. And for our some of our folks that are like 90 pounds, just having a bowl of oatmeal and a cup of coffee, that's a good breakfast. And that's all they want. That's why are we giving them the eggs and the toast and overwhelming them with all that other stuff if they don't want it. So that's what a cereal cart can look like. You can do this with soup, you know, crock pots of soup and a basket of um, buns or pita quarters or scones or breadsticks. Um, again, no tickets. We're just gonna talk to people. Um, and you know, this is this was these are photos shared with me from a community where you know they got their soup cart going and they even got little tags saying what type of soup it was. And they actually even wrote back to the food service department saying how much the residents love this. It started off with a dessert cart at lunch and supper, and then they moved to two types of soup, and they actually do food service um, mobile as well. So they moved away from tray service, and this is what they're doing. I love it. And then this is the Suzy Q. So Carmen said I can share with you about it. So this is what I invented because I was super frustrated with the lack of good equipment out there to allow us to go mobile with, with food and make it hot. So um, this is what a regular Suzy Q looks like. And this is a mini Suzy Q. So this feeds about 10 to 20 folks. This one serves 20 to 40 folks. And it can go anywhere. It can go in the dining room, up the elevators, down hallways. And it was a massive solution during COVID. Um, our food waste with it reduces um, down to 30 to 50%. So that's the like huge cost savings here. It actually pays for the equipment itself within half a year. So it's, it's really a very practical piece of equipment to help get the job done. So the point is, is, is that this is a cook. And this is a, um, a food service, um, a dining service aid right here. This is the cart between them. And they're each going to a table, showing with show plates what's available, and then listening to what the resident would like, and then turning around and making, customizing their plate, and then bringing that to them. And so the residents get exactly what they want. And, uh, and I can't even tell you how much better the meal service is with that. I had an executive chef tell me that last year they, they saved over $90,000 in their food costs. So, um, and we know by research as well that food complaints diminish on sites where people know and relate to the people actually cooking their food. So when the residents actually know the cook, they feel like the food service experience is better because there's a person associated with that. Um, and again, you are sharing a smile with the residents. The food is here, um, it's bulk, and you are customizing what they want. You can go into elevators, you can go to apartments, um, and it really is a massive solution during COVID. Um, yes, we have to cover food when we transport it because we don't want drippy pipes and people you know, all over it. But once you are where you need to be, then it's trained food service staff using food safe principles serving from it. So you can use a sneeze guard, you can use flip lids, you can use rolling shaking dishes. So again, it's trained food service staff using this. It is not a self-serve buffet. And that is the major difference. Um, when a health inspector comes and goes to these sites, really what you're doing is you are just showing them what your active managerial plan is for food safety. And if you can show that, then you're fine. So this was actually the mobile meal service with the Suzy Q's and the coffee service and desserts was actually published in foodmanagement.com publication during COVID showing how a mental home of 700, 700 elderly residents live here, as well as Rockwood retirement communities. This is almost 300 residents all did mobile meal service this way during COVID when they were in lockdown. So big solution for it. So really what you're doing is this is in the kitchen. You're loading up the carts with the choices. 
Um, yes, you have a sheet here saying who is on puree and minced and you know all that safety stuff that we have to communicate, which is important. Um, and then we go to where it is. So this is a community that used to do tray line right here. This is their kitchen. There's the ice machine for reference. They got ripped this all out and they put six Suzy Q carts here instead. There's the ice machine for reference. They load them up in the kitchen, unplug, and off they go to wherever they need to go. And um, it's just a great way to bring mobile meal service to table side at point of service. And this is what dessert service can look like too. So even if you start here, just start with a dessert service. You don't have to do everything right away. You might just start small by starting with dessert or start with a beverage service and put some choices in there so that if you ever hear, oh, we never are offered fresh fruit here. Well, always just have a basket of fresh fruit on your dessert cart and then it's always available. Um, have some choices of dessert. And I actually had a community call me and I call it the whipped cream story is, is that I had a dietitian phone me and she says, you know what we started to do? We started to put an aerosol can of whipped cream on our dessert cart. And so we decorate the desserts right in front of um, our elders and they love it. It's an activity. It makes a funny noise. And, you know, how much whipped cream can you, are you going to have? Um, you know, and, and our, our folks, they just love that. So really my argument is instead of doing the dining room run and having lots of lists, spend that same amount of time and go mobile and do let folks decide every day, every meal. And the goal is to get as close as you can to allow people the chance to talk. So really getting away from all these lists and spend that time instead talking because like folks with, with disabilities, I loved this poster because it said, I may not be able to talk, but I can still see and think and hear and love and hurt, laugh and feel. Please think before you assume. And isn't that true in, in our residential care communities as well? So that's kind of um, that piece of, I think I've kind of gotten the point across where you're just really slowing down and looking at people, having that eye contact and really talking to them. And this is my favorite photo of all times, which um, this person just wanted mashed potatoes. Even though this was the menu, they just wanted mashed potatoes and that is their fundamental right. Um, so I'm gonna kind of pause there and maybe we'll do some Q and A and then we're gonna have a 15 minute break and then I'll carry on with my other tips for you. Great, great questions, everyone. So either unmute in the talk or put it in the chat box. And um, here's something, uh, Suzanne. What advice do you have for administrators who want to be a catalyst for improvement, but no. I'm having a hard, sorry, Carmen, I'm having a hard time hearing you. It'll probably be better with your mic. Thank you. I apologize. That's uh, better. Yeah. What yeah. advice do you have for administrators who want to be a catalyst for improvement, but don't know a lot about dietary services or where to start. Thanks, that, Eric. That, that is a great, great question. question. That is a great question, Eric. Good job. Um, so I would advise you to come to the dining room during meal service. And if you need um, to even sit with a resident that might need some assistance during meal service and, and help feed them, um, you're sitting there and you're showing um, servant leadership by coming alongside the team and seeing food service, um, what the needs are of that resident and really just start immersing yourself in what the me menu is, who's doing what and that sort of thing. And I think just learning that maybe for the first three months um, and pick up a coffee pot and that sort of thing. And then um, my tip number nine, which I'll talk about, we'll be talking about learning circles when it comes to um, food service. Um, you can be a massive catalyst for that. So I'm not saying that you need to understand everything that dietitians and food management folks know, but um, as long as you are showing up and showing an interest, um, that will speak like a thousand words. That's what I would say. Um, hey, everyone, Eric and everyone. Uh, I knew an administrator in Colorado who sat 
and had lunch at a different table with residents every day she worked. And you know what she would say, Eric? She would always say, it's like a quote in Colorado. She would say, I know what goes on in my building. And notice it's backing completely what you're saying, Suzanne. If we all just live, my, my, my advice, everyone, would be to do more living with the people who live there. See, if you sit and have a meal, a real meal, the whole meal, just a mat, just, just go see what you'll learn, see? And Suzanne, just pass coffee and see what you see and hear what you hear. You guys, as a former surveyor, we had a famous uh, story. You might like this too, Suzanne. Um, the surveyors who were older than me that trained me, they would say this story. That They would say, yeah, you always know that the residents really don't know who the administrator is because they always say, who's that guy passing coffee with the suit on? <laughs> Sorry, administrators, but surveyors even would teach new surveyors that. Here is another question, Suzanne. How do you handle the different dietary requirements such as diabetics that will always choose to have the regular desserts? Yeah, and I can tell you as a registered dietitian, the best practices is, is that diabetics can have regular dessert. It's, um, so I, I wanna encourage you to get the Pioneer Network Dining Standards. There's a whole chapter right here on the standard of practice for individualized diabetic calorie control diets right here. And it will clearly tell you they can have regular dessert. Unless that person is a brittle diabetic and we are checking blood sugars like three times a day and we're insulin and they're in an acute care phase where they might be having to go to the hospital um, if you were not in that scenario and we're just allowing them to live, they need to have regular dessert. That's not your role to manage that. Um, let's see. Uh, can I add to that, everyone? Yes. Uh, Suzanne, <laughs> it does my heart good to see you showing the dining practice standards. Um, people may not realize I did all the typing. I was the lead on the dining practice standards um, and the toolkit that is for sale that was on Suzanne's list. So a couple things, everyone. If you would like more information about these dining standard practices or even a webinar in our second year of this grant, I could, I could help with that. We could even go slow. Every section of the dining practice standards is fantastic, if I say so. It wasn't me that did, I just did the typing, but to learn what it means to go real foods first or what it means, what, what um, Suzanne just said is they're right and really best practice is non-restricted diets. It goes against everything we've learned, right? So let me know, people listening, <laughs> if you would like more information about that. Um, and, and you could just start to learn what Suzanne is telling you about that she doesn't have time to do right here. Mm -hmm. uh, Suzanne, thing, we have another yeah. question, but go ahead. Yep. Yeah, the other thing I was going to say is you might also want to get the position paper from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and it's really clear about um, least restrictive diets in residential care settings. So again, tip number one, which is know and flood and teach other people with best practices, that would be what it is. So sometimes there's just some really old school and, you know, out of date folks that think that diabetics need to have fruit only, like really? <laughs> so I think yeah. you need to just um, really flood them with, oh, here's a paper. Oh, here's a position paper. Oh, yeah. here's the Pioneer Network Dining Standards on diabetic diets and just flood folks with it. So yeah. it's not just you thinking this and you not doing your job. Um, really, it's, we need um, to just edu educate. You know what else, you guys? Uh, the regulations actually say these things as well. People don't realize. I, I could help with that. You could look it up yourself, everyone. We've got surveyors in our movement in Wyoming. So regs actually say the things that uh, Suzanne is saying, believe it or not, in the guidance. Um, and one more thing, and then we got a question. Uh, by the way, everyone, in the new dining practice standards, we use the, the lingo informed choice and it actually comes from cms and notice the beauty of those two words informing you do the informing and and they get to do the choosing informed choice it's absolutely beautiful and here's a question with covid restrictions can visitors be at the tables visitors at the tables 
Do you know, Suzanne? Uh, maybe someone else. Uh, knows every 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 state it seems, or every place seems to have a different set of rules and that sort of thing. So I, mm -hmm. um, I don't know the right answer to that. To I don't either. And I think it might be a family oh. member asking. Um, um, this is Brittany Carmen. Hi, Brittany. Uh, I can answer a little bit just because I'm the one who does that in my community. Um, I work with our infection control nurse and right now in our community, we are not, uh, we are asking family members not to dine with our residents because um, in our main dining room, if they would like to dine with their loved one, we have them uh, go into a private dining room or one of our day rooms where they can be spread a little bit farther apart. Um, just so that they're not, uh, our dining room is pretty close together. Um, so just to prevent any unnecessary sure. uh, germ mingling. Um, <laughs> hopefully that will end soon, but we're also asking them not to participate in any of our activities with their loved ones as well for that reason. Yeah. I hope this will all be over so yes, soon. Yes, yes, we're moving I in that direction. So. Yes. Right. I think we're all so tired. Thank you, Brittany, yeah. for sharing that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, it's a it's a moving goalpost, so it's hard to know. And I would just, um, who, who, who asked that question, I would just have to say you have to go back to your um, mm -hmm. powers to be and find out what yeah. the rules are in yeah. that um, county or state um, about right. it. Right, right. Let's see, uh, we have just a few more minutes, everyone, and then we'll break three minutes. Um, I wanna add another something that might interest you all, you too, Suzanne. This is such a cool story. Um, in the early 2000s, we started the Culture Change Coalition in Colorado. And I happened to be on a survey uh, when I was still a surveyor. And of course, dining, some things with dining didn't go so well. Of course, you guys, if the oatmeal is ever gonna get burnt, it's when the surveyors are there, right? <laughs> And sadly, there was a deficient practice found in dining. Well, because of the culture change coalition movement, guess what? This team was so brilliant. They applied culture change to the plan of correction, basically. And they put in their plan of correction that they're going to correct the dining deficiencies by starting um, breakfast cooked to order. <laughs> and, and they would always make the point that um, when you put something in your plan of correction, you are way more likely to actually do it. So tip from me, guys, one way to force yourself to do better practice is to say you will in a plan of correction. And the flip side, if we have any surveyors listening, I've heard uh, leaders in our culture change movement who are also regulators say things like, even as surveyors, we should get more creative. We should um, encourage communities maybe to to fix deficiencies in more creative ways and, enc and encourage them to put it in the plan of correction. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, anybody, anything else? Comment, question, don't see any. So should we just take a break everyone? We will take a full 15. We'll take a full 15 and then I'll come back and share with you guys my top five, six, seven, Beautiful. And then allow you time to have a plan, get a plan together, and hopefully we can listen to it with us because I think we learn better when we're talking to each other. You bet. Thanks, Suzanne. And okay. feel free to enter questions or comments during the break too, everyone. All right. Thank you.
Hi, Brittany. Your your outfit. Oh, your outfit looks the same. <laughs> is, is today toga day or what? I don't know a thing about it. I can't hear you. You have to unmute, please. Hi, Suzanne. Hello. Is it toga it's day or what? Yeah, it's National okay. Toga Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> but I forget when I do these crazy spirit days for my staff, <laughs> I am still visible to other people. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, it could have been worse, I guess. <laughs> well, I had to go to the gas station this morning. They thought it was hilarious. <laughs> That's good for you. I love it. I love good it too. It's love so it. great. So awesome. Okay, how are we? Three minutes, everybody. Well, International Women's Day. All the yes. strong, smart, powerful, amazing women out there being amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I even put the dog in a toga this morning, Carmen. Oh my goodness, that's so fun. He was not a fan. Yeah, I can see that. It was fun trying though, huh? Yep. It lasted for about an hour. Oh, a whole hour. That's pretty good. Yeah, then he was like, get it off. So he he's just naked now. <laughs> Brittany, <laughs> That's you, funny. Brittany, do you bring your dog to work? <laughs> yes, I do. Oh, that's so great. That's so great. One of the communities that I work at um, they have two cats that sit in a little thing together all the time. They're just snuggled in all the time. And then um, there is a uh, community dog as well. So always love going and visiting with them. Yeah. So we have um, my little nugget that comes with me. And then one of our, um, I think she's a Coda, brings her, she has a big uh, like golden, golden doodle that she brings in. Um, and they're here pretty much all the time. Love it. Uh, and then we have guinea pigs and an aviary full of birds. Uh, so so there's lots of critters. Yeah. So good. It's fabulous. People plant and people, children and pets. Right? That's right. Yes. That's right. Sleep on my iPad. Uh, Suzanne, I think I told this to Brittany recently, but when I was an activity director, I realized. I couldn't compete. There's nothing I could plan that would ever compete with the children or the animals and nope. rightfully so. <laughs> and therefore we need more of them. Yes. We actually have, uh, Oh, it's on the ninth, I think. Hang on. Mm -hmm. Which is tomorrow. Nope. <laughs> nope not the ninth. It's the ah. 13th. Uh, <laughs> that is, um, canine veterans day. Ooh, wow. And so, on Monday, not on the actual Sunday, but on Monday, I have uh, a police officer coming in with his canine oh. and they're going to do a demonstration. Oh, um, and then everybody will get to love on the dog. So oh, good for I'm pretty you. excited about that one. Nice job. Have them come again and again. <laughs> yes. You know, all right. All hey, time. guess what? It's time. Here we go. Okay, you can hear me okay? Yep. Okay. You sound good. Amazing. Okay, good. Okay, so I hope I'm flooding you all with some good practical tips, um, keeping it real, and then you get to pick and choose which ones you like and which ones you get to um, ignore and which ones you might want to try. So, so my tip number five um, for you is really shifting our long-term care in institutional thinking to really more the hospitality model um, and really bringing in that dining etiquette and um, really looking our, at our institutional language. And I must have a little shout out here for Carmen because Carmen has taught me a lot about that institutional language. Um, and she has a lot of resources and she could probably speak wisely about that. But um, I have, I'm, I'll totally be honest with you here is, is that I've had to be um, really check in with myself about the words that I kind of have just learned over time that are really not good words to use. Um, and so 
when I kind of that whole thing about when you know better, you do better. Um, and I really feel that this is an area that I have grown a lot in, in my dietetic practice, um, is really moving away from an institutional model. Research shows us that this is not working. And we also use terms in healthcare, long-term care that are not used in everyday life. It's only used in that healthcare setting. And they sound ridiculous, actually, when you start thinking about it. So I think we really need as leaders to really um, talk about what good etiquette looks like, set the standards, and that we need to change our language because we need to sound better. We need to look and sound more professional and it allows the staff to be more engaging. So here's some examples. So instead of director of dietary, like what does that mean? That sounds so institutional. Maybe consider changing your title to a hospitality team leader or dining and hospitality manager, culinary manager, dining experience manager, or dining coordinator. Those just sound better than director of dietary. Same with our dietary aid. Um, they can be used server or wait staff or hostess or dining service advocate, dining service assistant or nutrition partner. Those are all better terms. And you know, just talking about our old language, which is on the left hand side here, versus some new language. So instead of facility, we're using the term home and community. Um, instead of wing and unit, I mean, I said that all the time. Um, I really now I can't stand saying those words. So I'm, you know, I'm learning and I'm doing better myself, but I do catch myself. So, um, you know, using the word neighborhood or household instead of day room, um, it's a living room or family room. Instead of a job, we talk about a role. Instead of a manager or supervisor, you are a leader. Um, a resident refused to um, their their meal. No, they declined it. Um, are we going to toilet the residents? No, they're going to go use the restroom. Uh, we're going to transport a resident from here to there. No, you're going to assist them by walking with them. You know, all of these, when you really start getting really mindful of what institutional language sounds like and looks like, it actually starts really bothering you. And I want it to bother you. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. So, um, there's a really good um, list out there. If you want that list, um, you know, just reach out to me or Carmen um, and we can help you with that. Um, and so when I'm talking about service etiquette, so this is really now in the dining room, what the training that you should be doing as a leader uh, with your group is really setting the standards of what you want to see. So when people come to the dining room, they are noticed they are welcomed and they matter because we all want that, right? So you're, um, you are greeting them with a warm welcome and a fond farewell, like, hello, John, or see you at supper afterwards, the eye contact using their preferred name. Do they like Mrs. Jones or do they like Mabel? Introducing the food item at the table and listening to their choice, talking to them directly, like looking at them and talking to them and empowering them to make a decision. Serve on the left, remove from the right clean aprons. I went to this one community recently and honestly the cook came out of the kitchen with the ugliest, dirtiest, greasiest apron I've ever seen. And I think to myself, if that's what the apron looks like, I wonder what the food tastes like. So again, the, the visual is so important um, and that you have your name tag on and that you're smiling and you know, remember that this is their home and that meal hour is actually a protected meal hour. So there is research that has come out of Europe talking about the benefits of an actual protected meal hour. So there's no activities going on. There's no, um, you know, med card in the dining room. That whole thing is that this is a protected meal hour and that all hands are on deck and deck and we honor that. And I actually like this acronym of service. Um, I've made it and posted this so that everyone's mindful of it, of what this actually looks like and feels like when you come into um, this elder's dining room. We want it to be social. We want it to feel enthusiastic. We want it respectful, vibrant, intelligent, meaning there's wise decisions being made. We're courteous and we are engaged. So that is everybody's job. 
or role, I should say, not job, role. <laughs> See, I caught myself. Um, so this was a community that I really liked, um, Lakewood Health Care Nutrition Services. They actually made a mission statement and it's posted right um, in the door going out from the kitchen into the dining room. And they created this mission statement themselves. And they basically wanted to stay mindful of why are they there? And I think this helps with staff re retention and enthusiasm, you know, provide, um, provide exceptional dining experience. No food leaves our kitchen. We ourselves would not eat. Be loose and have fun. I love that. I think it's so great. So again, everyone's on the same page as why we're there. All right, number, number six. <laughs> Oh, this one, this one's a bit of a thorn in my side is how does your team look? What's the attire? Is it a clean apron? Is the hair pulled back and restrained? Do you have a name tag on? Or do you look like you're going in and having surgery? Right? We do not use blue bonnets in the hospitality industry. When was the last time you went to a restaurant and your wait staff showed up with at your table with a blue bonnet? It doesn't make sense, it's not normal. So use the invisible hair nets if you need to, a half hair tied back, you know, get creative, but really these surgical blue bonnets have no place in residential care. Um, and really leaning, leaning into what the hospitality industry does. So, um, you know, invest in some black and white serving jackets or aprons or vests um, and make your culinary team look amazing. Um, and guess what? The residents love it. They love the chef with the chef hat coming out and, and serving them. They feel very special if the cook if the chef has come out and talked to them. So ditch the worn out ugly aprons, get away from the kindergarten clothes is what I call it, and uh, really just kind of spruce it up. So this is what we should be leaning towards at front of the house. At the back of the house, you know, do what you want. Um, but when we are serving our elders, they, this is their dining room and we need to make the dining experience amazing. It has to look amazing too. So again, you automatically feel like you're going to get better service from a chef wearing a chef jacket and the chef hat than you do with someone wearing a kindergarten outfit, right? So I just really want to encourage you that way. Yes, we have to do all our food safety stuff. We need HASA, we need to use tongs, we need to wash our hands, we need to, you know, if we wear gloves if you're touching ready to eat food. But if you're not touching ready to, to eat food, you do not need to serve with those blue surgical gloves. You do not get served that way when you go to a restaurant. So why are we doing that in residential care? I don't know. So um, look at your food safety plan you know, hand washing tongs, temperatures, that sort of thing. But when you go to the front of the house, that service should be, you know, looking like the hospitality industry. And I think we need to learn that a little bit better in healthcare. Um, we, everyone gets worried, oh, everyone's so sick. They're not sick in residential care. They're not. Yes, they're maybe less, um, you know, might be more immune compromised, but they're not sick people. So let's keep it more like a home. So, and then do you serve your family with blue gloves <laughs> in your own house? So we should not be doing this in our home. Okay, that's um, number six. Number seven is food needs to look good, taste good, and get creative. So as I said before, food is only nourishing if people eat it. So work with your vendors and partners to stretch that maybe six to $8 that you have to work with a day to feed your folks. Um, your budget might be higher than that, um, yay, if you get more than that, but some folks don't. So you have to get creative, and they are more than happy to help you with, with how to do that. So I find that folks don't um, kind of lean into those, um, you know, the, the Trimarks, the Cisco's, the Gordon Foods, you know, folks as much as they could, um, because they have lots and lots and lots of good resources there. So um, and maybe you have to invest in a little bit of training with your cooks and your chefs, uh, maybe some continuing education and some courses. I do want to say that I feel sometimes that there's a bit of a turf war between cooks and food managers and dietitians for some reason. And I think we need to, as the three of us, um, especially focused on food service, 
that we really need to be on the same page because um, we have the same goal. So you might need to have some really honest conversations about what everyone's role is and that you all care about food service and how to get that done well. So, um, and here's some ideas um, with our folks on puree diet instead of the three scoop special. And um, honestly, if I see staff mixing all three together, I literally will freak out. Um, so just get creative with your um, puree world. So there is, um, you can get these high heat um, bags and you can create amazing things. You can also get sauces, all different types of sauces here that can, um, you know, do desserts with or um, lots of different things with. So feel free to get creative with puree um, food for those folks as well. Here's some other fun ideas for you. Um, you can do an action station. So again, residents um, watching breakfast getting made, just like um, this gentleman is doing right here. A concierge table like this at the front of your dining room and greet people when they come to the dining room. And that is a really great role for a food service manager or an administrator. Um, just stand there and welcome people into um, the dining room. Here's another question, pose a question of the day under the menu board um, and think of, you know, just to help stimulate some conversation during uh, the meal time. Like what was your favorite job? Uh, what was your most unusual vacation? Tell us what pets you had. Um, and it really just helps folks um, have a leading question to have some conversation behind. Um, thrift store China cups. You can pick those up for a dollar. They're, you know, the little China cups. Instead of those being just for special, why don't you use them every day? Why don't you have them in the coffee corner? Um, you know, these are fun things that this generation probably grew up on having those types of coffee cups. Centerpieces. Um, you might want to approach a garden center or a florist or a grocery store chain and see after a certain amount of time, they actually um, throw out their, their flowers and that sort of thing. Say to them, would you consider donating them to us and make centerpieces as an activity and then they're part of the um, dining room. Spotify um, subscription for $100 and have music from the 30s and the 40s or the 50s. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to communities where the um, you know top 40 is playing because the staff like it. That is not, again, that generation's music. So the music should be from the 30s and the 40s um, playing nicely in the background. And then I went to a community and I loved this. I just made my heart just swell up huge and I almost got teary eye when it happened but they had each every day they had a different resident do a greeting or a blessing or a gratitude story before the meal and I tell you it only took takes 30 seconds to a minute but it is the most beautiful thing and just coming together and having a meal together and taking time to be grateful and thankful and sharing a blessing. And whether you're a religious community or not, um, you know, you can do some type of gratitude or story. So when the elders or the residents are in charge of that, it's amazing what can come out. So you don't have to own that. You can just pass that duty on. Um, here's another idea is just dressing up in your Sunday best. Um, clothes for lunch is kind of a fun um, thing to do as well. Okay. Okay. So number eight would be don't be shy to ask for help. So how does your dining room feel? Does it feel depressing? Does it feel old? Does it feel tired? And does this reflect in the dining experience? So does it need a facelift? Does it need new curtains, some paint, pictures, lights, tableware, dishcloths? You know, what does it need? Do you need new equipment? Um, you have to be the advocate for communicating your needs. Um, you might need to write a dining room capital campaign grant and find the money. And if you don't have grant money, then you might need to ask for funds outside of operations. You might want to communicate the needs via a family um, resident newsletter. Um, and you never know what family or friends might want to help. 
there might be private donors out there that you had no idea had an extra $5,000 to donate to somebody, to the home. So I'm gonna show you this example. So this is um, a camp I used to go to with my husband and my kids. It's called Barnabas Family Camp. And um, we would have many summers here. It was lovely, but they are nonprofit. And, but they send out a newsletter um, every quarter. And at the bottom of the newsletter right here, they have a wish list. So this um, semester or this quarter, they said that they needed a suburban vehicle. I mean, think of the money there. A ski boat, not cheap either. Electric golf cart and furniture. Four months later, they put out the newsletter again. And this is what they got. They got the suburban. They got a wood chipper that they had asked for before. And they got new yard furniture. And I just think, wow, all you had to do was put it in your wish list. And you're probably already sending out a newsletter to family. So why not put a little thing in there? And so if this is an example that happened at a community that they wanted to buy a Suzy Q. So I know of this because of Suzy Q. And they put the wish list um, request out there. And then they got this equipment funded. Um, by the Lions Club, donations from residents and family, and then they got the equipment that they needed. So again, it probably wasn't in operations, but they had the ability to, um, to get it by putting their needs out there. So if you want to know what great equipment looks like in food services, um, I just wanted to let you know there is a food equipment show that happens once every two years. It usually happens in Florida over 600 of the world's leading of, um, equipment and supplier manufacturers of food service show up here. It is massive. I go to it. And um, some of the best equipment and food service shows up here. So that is there if you ever want to go to the best food equipment show that is there. Okay, so <laughs> this is these are photos that were passed on to me by a community that was, they, they moved to the Suzy Q cart. So they did this, they got their carts and they were so excited and they passed on these photos to me. And, you know, my first thought was when I saw this photo was, wow, that is a depressing dining room. Like, just look at it. For instance, I, there's a green thing hanging from the ceiling here. I have no idea what that is. This picture is way too small. These tables look really tall um, and boring. Um, it's crowded. Like it just is like, meh. And same with this. Like it just looks, meh, not great. Versus you go to, there's these communities that have these dining rooms and they're like, wow. So what is the difference between this and this? What's the difference? Money, right? Money and vision. So what I'm saying to you is get your vision and find the money and you can have a really positive dining space for your folks to come together at three times, um, three times a day. It's really quite amazing. So again, we're not even talking about the quality of the food, but we're talking about the space that people are in. So get a vision, um, get some help. If you're not amazing in interior design work or decorating like I am not but I can definitely ask for some help and you'll never know who's out there there might be a daughter who is an interior decorator um, who has a, their mom at your site you don't know you need to ask for help so I just want to encourage you that this is what some um, residential care dining rooms do look like but if your community is looking like this, you need some vision. Okay. And to help you, there is actually the Research Institute of Aging. So there's the website. They actually have two checklists that they have created about the meal time as well as the dining room space. And this is research based. And you can go to their website and the resources are right here. And you can go through it and then prove to the decision makers that yes, our dining room is really bad with layout and furniture and lighting and ambiance. And you know, we got work to do. So um, if you have a copy of this, do you use it? Do you have a wish list and communicating it to your team? So I want to encourage you there. Okay. Number nine is use social media. 
um, to really highlight your team, your menu, your specials, your events, your food, your, you know, everything there is such a fun way. I mean, social media is how the grandkids get to know what's going on, or even the kids know what's going on. So Menno Place here took this photo of um, their staff member uh, making fresh cinnamon buns. So if you saw this on your social media feed, you would be going, oh, look, mom, mom got some fresh cinnamon buns today. Those look amazing. So when I call mom today and I have a conversation with her, I can say, hey, um, I see that they made some fresh cinnamon buns today. Did you get one? How were they? You know, a conversation piece, right? Or even just these other things. So these are just some really good ideas. And what it does is it puts you in the driver's seats of social media. Because if you aren't, this is what can happen. So this is a true story that happened um, a few years ago. Um, this is Darlene Mitchell. She is a daughter of um, a gentleman who um, lives in residential care. And she went to go visit him on Christmas day. And she was so upset with the meal that was plunked down in front of him. Again, there was no choice. There was no conversation. He was just throw and go, plunk down. This was the meal. She got her phone out because we all have our phones. She took a, can a picture of it and then she put, posted it on her Facebook page and she was furious. Look at what my dad was served on Christmas day. This photo was then shared and shared and shared so much so it then got picked up by the Provincial um, News Association for um, the province of Saskatchewan. CBC. CBC is kind of our, um, our main news uh, media source here in Canada. This story was posted on their website, and I don't know if you can see it, but it was shared 381 times in two days. They received over 1,500 negative comments in two days. This story actually went international. It was even featured in Europe. Can you imagine the PR nightmare that this community then had to deal with? So I'm on holidays for Christmas and I actually get called by CBC Radio News. And they said, we would like to have you on our talk show because we have this story and we have invited Darlene Mitchell, the daughter, the food manager, and we would like you as an expert to come and help navigate what went wrong. I'm like, oh, good Lord, <laughs> what a tough position to be put in. And because I've been that food manager and that sort of thing. And what th the story doesn't tell you is, is that they had a big Christmas dinner at lunch hour where it was the turkey and the stuffing and the mashed potatoes and that sort of thing. But Darlene didn't know that. And so they thought in their wisdom, well, we'll just do cold cuts and, um, you know, buns and pickles and um, potato salad as a light supper, because um, everyone's probably full from lunch. But because there was no conversation with Darlene, and there was no conversation with her dad, and this was just a throw and go situation, there was such a lack of information. So that's what comes out. And so what I want to say to you is, is that everybody has social media and they're coming in and visiting their loved ones. You need to be really aware that of the really negative impact it can have if your meal service isn't a nine or a 10. So I encourage you to be more proactive and highlight your staff, highlight the menu, highlight your team, highlight the special events so that you can do that. And you just need permission um, to use those photos. I know there's lots of things around that, but um, see if you can work with your organization. All right. And my last tip is an enhanced dining committee learning circle. So last week, um, Carmen had an amazing guest speaker on this topic. I am nowhere near as, as um, intellectual as she is when it comes to this, but I have done learning circles and I can tell you from a practical point of view, it is really, really powerful. So what you want to do is you want to, it's different than just going to resident council or the food committee. Um, what you're doing is you're bringing um, some really, you're handpicking the key, some key people together um, from your food service department, nursing activities, a family rep, a resident a management team member, and probably a board member if you have a board member and you're coming together and you're dreaming together 
and you're really figuring out what you want to do when it comes to meal service. What is working? What is not working? Where do you want to go? Um, and really giving everybody the floor an equal amount of time. Um, and it helps grow respect and team satisfaction, which means retention, which means that people feel like they are heard. Um, I'm just going to skip the slide here. So this is what I did actually last week. Um, I was at a community where um, I felt like we needed to have some really honest conversations about meal service because I wasn't happy with what I was seeing. And so I brought my conch shell like this. This is my conch shell. Um, but you can have a talking stick. You can go into the forest and pick up a talking stick or what's that, Carmen? Is that a talking stick? It looks like a talking stick. Um, yes, I made it at the Eden Alternative Training with Laverne Norton. Isn't that cool? Oh, yeah. It's just a stick, guys, that you can decorate. Yeah, mm -hmm. a talking, Wonderful. talking stick. Or um, I brought the conch shell from the Lord of the Flies, if you know that, where, you know, you basically, if you get the talking stick or the shell, you then have the floor. And what it does is it allows everyone the opportunity and a chance to listen and to talk. Um, and so I, this is how I started my meeting. And so I'll just share it with you is um, first, I just went around the room and I just said, tell me something about yourself for two minutes. And it was fascinating what I learned about some of the staff. Um, I learned that one staff member um, immigrated from Jamaica on her own and left her husband and um, two-year-old behind um, in order to immigrate. I learned that one of the staff who I worked really closely with, I didn't know that she was a single mom. Um, I learned one of the staff members put herself through school and all the challenges with that. Like, it was just really, really helpful to kind of learn who these people were that I was in this room with. And then I set clear purpose and ground rules about how we're going to listen to everybody. It's going to be a safe space, um, all equal voices, and that we're going to dream together. And then I allowed them the ability to just brainstorm three ideas privately about what they wanted to change about meal service. And then they had to present to the group. And what was amazing was the common themes that we all had. So be a strong advocate for excellent dining services. And if you are the food manager or the um, food service manager, you must be the strongest um, advocate for sure. So just talking about behavior change, um, I have found this really helpful um, to learn in my practice as a dietitian. Um, is the stages of behavior change. If you don't know them, um, I'll just review it really quick, but you might want to check it out a little bit more, is, is that first you have the pre-contemplative stage, which means I have no problem, there is no problem here, our meal service is amazing, and all of you can just, you know, go away. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we are fine here. That's pre-contemplative. Contemplative is like, hmm, maybe we do have something to work on. I'm open to maybe thinking about it or talking about it. And then we're going to prepare to actually do something about it. That might be preparing to have a learning circle. And then if you're actually doing a learning circle, then you're moving to action where we're going to actually learn about what needs to change and doing something about it. And then we do it. That's maintenance. And then the reality is you can relapse really quickly. So um, it's important just to really understand behavior change. And it really works really well when you use that framework. So if you are approaching a staff member who's like, we have no problem here. Everything's just fine. I don't know what they're talking about. They are pre-contemplative. So it helps being able to kind of shift your team towards behavior change. So um, I've used that in my dietetic practice as well. And when you get a group or a team together and you really are talking about what the issues are, you can do amazing things. So Rockwood Care Center, this is a team here that they realized before um, they did some changes, they were having issues with temperature, self-determination, portion control. And then after they worked together, what the improvements were. So this was done pre and post. And then this is my most favorite photo is that this group won the Tennessee State Award for Innovation with doing buffet dining at their door. But, you know, they did it as a team. 
and they actually won the state award of innovation. So you can do amazing things when you get your team together. So deep breath. Here's my top 10 just to review it. And then um, what I would love is I would love you to figure out which three you might want to work on at your site. And then I would love you to share with the group if you're open to it. So one is to lean on research, best practices, culture change resources to lead your way. If you need any of those resources, let me know. I would be more than happy to share them with you. Follow the food from start to finish for the entire meal hour. And what did you notice? Do an anonymous dining experience survey for family, residents, and staff. Move would be number four. Go bulk mobile to allow for maximum choice and self-determination for all items. Five, dining etiquette and institutional language is really shifting to the hospitality model. Six is appearance. How does your team look? Do they have a name tag on? Are they clean? Are they looking professional? Seven, food needs to look good and taste good. Be creative outside of the standard way. Eight, don't be shy and ask for needs. Make your space beautiful. Get the right equipment. Ask for money. Um, you know, aim high. <laughs> Nine, use social media in a positive way and beware of the negative side of social media. And 10, the enhanced um, dining learning circle. Get your team talking, listening, and excited about what you can do together. So those are my 10. Um, I, I mean, there might be more out there, but I hopefully those 10 will be helpful to you. But I just kind of wanted to end with saying that um, resident satisfaction with the quality in food and the dining experience should be a home's priority. And that's from the Pioneer Network. That is my contact information there. If you want it at all, you're more than welcome to email me or reach out or be friend, follow me on LinkedIn if you want as well. Um, I'd be more than happy to um, be friends. <laughs> so. Um, with that, what I wanted you to do is I wanted you to, like in a learning circle, um, I wanted you to write out maybe three things that you yourself would like to work on at your site. Out of those top 10, what are three ideas that you are taking away with you um, today? And I don't know if you want to pop them into the chat box um, or whatever, but I think maybe Carmen, I'll, I'll pass yeah. it over to you mm -hmm. and you can. Sure. Um, yep. Okay, here they come. Side. So guys, I have two big things to tell everyone. Suzanne, first of all, could you please post your handout? This might take you a moment. We didn't plan on this, but if you've never done it, Suzanne, since you're the host, I can't do it apparently. If you go to chat box, you'll see some icons on the top and one yeah. looks like a piece of paper. Yeah. And you just click on it and you go pull up a, pull up your handout, please. And then people can download it right here while we're doing q and Is that okay, Suzanne? The challenge is, is because there's so many photos and stuff in it is that the file was so big oh. that we couldn't do it. So I had to do it oh. you via Dropbox. Okay. But what we can do is, is that if people want it, could they email me? Sure. And or me. Yep. That were you. So so Suzanne, you, you, let me just clarify, you've already tried to pull it up to the chat box on I Zoom? Have, I tried to um, send it to you. Ah, well, let's just try on, on Zoom chat, okay. go to that little icon that looks like a piece of paper, and it should let you say um, to uh, go get a document, like from, you get options, you can go to Google or your computer. Do you see that? Sorry to make y'all wait. So do you happen to see an icon that looks like a piece of paper with a little fold on the corner in, when you go to your chat? Yeah. I, do you see that? Yes, I do. See okay. That. And then you click on it. Yes. And now it gives you choices. Okay. And probably, you know, go to your computer, I would yeah, guess, my or yeah, the yeah, cloud yeah. or whatever. Okay. If you want to work on that, that please, yeah. Suzanne. I, will um, I have something for everybody else. If you guys would be so kind. Um, I didn't really have a way to send out a survey. I didn't know who would all come to this. And so what would really help me for the grant is if in the chat box, you could just give, you know how Wyoming always does um, before and after. So before this training, what did you know about this 
everything that <laughs> Suzanne just taught you. And then after, and the ranking or not ranking, but the numbers are always one to five, low to high. It would really help me a lot if you all could do that right now in the chat box. And then I have a way to put that into the report um, for the grant later. Thank you so, so much. Everyone's doing it. God bless my new friends from Wyoming. And then of course, we would also love a question. Hey, Suzanne, I see it. Brittany, it's there. Could, could someone try to download it and see if it works for you? The handout is now in the chat box. This is a cool feature of Zoom, everyone. And we can all try to download it. And it looks like it's letting me. Yeah, hopefully that should work everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. So how about a question, a comment? Did you learn something? What are you going to take back? Um, Suzanne, Brittany kindly is answering your question. Number one, appearance. Number two, feed, food needs to look good and taste good. And number three, the enhanced dining learning circle. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank so, you, Brittany. Brittany, did you um, attend the um, learning circle webinar last week? Yeah. And so using that and Brittany, what's your role there at? I'm the activities director here. Um, and I have lots of staff who are interested, but trying to get everyone to sit down in the same space uh, for like 10 minutes is kind of a pain in the booty. So uh, the learning circles is something I'm definitely looking at uh, for my management team leaders. Yeah, yeah it's really powerful. Um, and just getting people, I think some people think that if you're the administrator, you have all the Suzanne, oh. I can't oh. hear you that good. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say that you don't need to have all the answers. You just have to bring people together and facilitate the conversation. So I encourage you with that for sure. How, how about other ones? Um, other folks, what did out of those 10, and I'll scoot back to the 10 here, which ones are you going to maybe try and work on or um, have conversations with? And hopefully someone, just, just unmute yourselves, guys. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and Suzanne, one thing you may not know is we have a couple ombudsmen on the line today. Huh. And they're listening to share these ideas with the homes where they get to know people. Amazing. So, Love to hear from you guys too. Hi, Suzanne, this is Patty. Hi, Patty. Um, you know, I worked in nursing homes for a total of 30 years and I did all kinds of different jobs. And you always see staff members who, oh, I don't have time for that change. And, and, and you know, there were times when, you know, being young, I didn't like change either. But I found that if you gave the resident what made them happy. For instance, a resident would have a fit because her medicine was 30 minutes late and they're always on the light and they're, so you're, so staff is going in and out and answering the light and telling him, oh, the nurse will be here as soon as they can. And then that staff member is bugging the nurse and blah, 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 blah. And if you just make it a point in your routine to give that patient their medicine on time, you save so much time and hassle and stress on the patient and then everybody's happy. And it can be the same thing with dining. If you just give the patient what they, what they want and what they like and what they're used to and what works well for them, it saves time, you know, all around. And, and as you pointed out money in the resident is happy, they're eating better, they're drinking better, their skin is better, their urinary tract and digestive system are better, and it just all benefits everybody all around. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, at first, it's, it's, it's kind of a pain to, to change and, and, and try to put these things in place. But, you know, with lots of encouragement from the upper management and the upper management not complaining, then I really think that it could be, it could be a benefit to everybody. Mm -hmm. Very well said, Patty. Yeah, I would agree with you completely. Instead of being reactive, if we're more proactive with, with involving our folks in the conversation, then there's that buy-in to allow them to 
be part of the solution and be more gracious and stuff. And, you know, it brings me back to that point where the research shows us that when people know and relate to the people responsible for cooking the food, they're more gracious and understanding. So I think that when we bring our, our elders into the conversation um, and they're part of the decision-making process, then they're going to be um, more understanding and be part of the family of caring together rather than it being such a reactive space. Part of the family, I like that. Mm -hmm. And you, everybody, proactive is the answer to everything. <laughs> you know, what's, what's long-term care famous for? Being proactive or reactive? Yeah. Reactive. <clears throat> and it's our, it's our moment in time, everyone, mm -hmm. to flip the script there yeah. and to become more proactive and everyone will benefit in, in every way. You know, I, I teach a lot on being proactive to prevent falls. Just think about everything can be more proactive to prevent the problems and to, to know the person, like you said, function like a family. It's so beautiful. I see uh, the Wyoming retirement um, team. Um, they said they're, the th three they're gonna work on is knowing and um, learning the research um, the dining survey and going mobile. So those are three excellent ones. So again, if you need any support or help or advice or um, someone to lean into to help with any of that, just feel free to reach out to me. And Suzanne, I missed a question. Uh, could you please explain approximately how much each of the Suzy Q carts that do cost, please? People would like to know. Oh, well, that's a good question. And actually, I can't answer that because I don't sell them. But I can tell you that every food equipment supplier does sell them. So whether it's Direct Supply or Trimark or Cisco or Gordon mm -hmm. Foods or, um, you know, almost every single food equipment supplier in the U.S. sells the Suzy Q. So I would just reach out to them and get a quote. And I would encourage you to get three quotes <laughs> because mm -hmm. different people sell different things. It's like how much would... Um, it's like asking someone, how much does a mix master cost? Um, you know what? I yeah. don't know. But what I do know, what I can tell you is that whenever a cart is sold, I actually personally call the community that gets a Suzy Q and I work with that food service team to make sure that they are implementing it the right way possible. So I kind of come with the Suzy Q so that wow. homes aren't by themselves trying to do it. So, um, and I can tell you that usually the food waste that they save with the Suzy Q easily pays for the cart very quickly. And the, um, the lifeline on the Suzy Q is about 20 years. So that's a piece of equipment that's going to last you 20 years to get the job done. So I think you have to look at it in lots of different ways, but um, reach out to your food equipment supplier. Um, and also the website is hotfoodcart.com. If you want to, want to check that out, it's right there, hotfoodcart.com. Cool. And plus there's um, two sizes, right? So keep yeah. that in mind, everyone. Yeah. You know, if, sizes. if that helps, you know, mm -hmm. depending on your dining room size, et cetera. And if you need any advice about all of that, just let me know too. And I'm happy to talk you through that. Again, it's the vehicle to help get the job done. Um, but you you have to make sure your team is on board with what the culture change is behind it all. Sure. I want to just thank you, Suzanne, you and your husband for inventing it. It is really <laughs> quite an um, awesome addition to this field. I truly mean that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, True. you know, when you're frustrated, what's the saying is, is that invention is the, oh, there's a certain oh, someone help me. Invention is the mother or father mother or something. Of, mother of invention or something. I don't know, something about like when you're frustrated and you need something invented because you're like, oh, yeah. I need yes. something. That's how, yes. that's where it came from. So yeah. Yes. Um, here it is, Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl. Necessity thank is the you. mother of invention. <laughs> Together, we're stronger. Thank That's you, Cheryl. Yes, thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> I need to put, put that on a post-it note right yeah. by my computer. Yeah, you do. That. Yeah. Good. Oh. Yeah, That's okay. You know, let that be a shining light for all of us, everyone, that when something's not working, rather than just complain, to be part of the solution, right? Mm -hmm. You did that. That's great. 
Um, let's see. Well, everyone would love to still have some conversation. What are you dying to ask Suzanne? She's with us. She knows a lot about a lot of things. She won't be with us next week. Could someone ask her a, a question? And while you're pondering that, everyone, I just have a couple of things I could add. Um, I read a book once uh, called Bon Appetit. Suzanne, have you read that book? Probably Bon Appetit, The Joy of Dining. Yeah. And it's, it's about long-term care. And the reason I bring it up, everyone, is it, it just said something that you kind of did too, Suzanne, that, that um, oh, I love this idea. Whenever any team member walks into the dining room, they, they are transformed into the best server that has ever been. So whether you're the nurse guys or the maintenance guy, right? You're, you're, everything changes the minute you're in the dining room and you are part of the team to make this meal the best meal that these people have ever experienced in their entire lives. Isn't that cool? <laughs> what a wonderful expectation on people. And well, um, I don't know what also, you think of that. It might also be their last meal. Oh my too. goodness, yes. And yeah. so when people say, well, what about the diabetic, di you know, people yeah. are diabetic and stuff, it's like, yeah. no, Ugh. it might be their last meal. Wow. So let's make it the best one that wow. they can have. Or even with some of my folks at a community that I uh, work at as the clinical dietitian, um, for some of our folks that are really failure to thrive and underweight and malnutrition, um, we serve them dessert first. <laughs> they wonderful. get dessert first. That's I'm like, let's start with dessert wow. and then work towards the vegetables. <laughs> wow. That's beautiful. <laughs> so, that you know, so why not? Good. Why not? Yes. Because yes. they might just yes. get full up on the, on the dessert mm. and then they're mm. exhausted from eating mm. and that's it. So it's like, mm. okay, get dessert wow. first then. You know what so. that makes me want to say everyone is it's about living first. You see, care gets too much attention in this business that we all find ourselves in. Sure, it's long-term care. Sure, it's residential care. But do you realize it's actually more than that? And every time you and I say care, we're not saying life and we're not saying living and we're missing something. See, we always talk about the care they receive and the care that we give, but we rarely talk about the life they're living. And so to be offered dessert first is a beautiful picture of life first, everyone. Even though we get paid to care for people, we got to flip the script. You see, we always look through the lens of our professional clinical job. That's why we would ever call someone a patient. No, they're a person. Please join me, guys. They're a person first. They're not patients. You and I are patients to our physician, but we're just not the patients, you see. <laughs> and, and it's, it's really about living like Suzanne, since we're sisters in this, you might consider talking about residential living. Isn't that cool? Yeah, like some of the, much. some of the not-for-profits like leading age, they've, they've pulled this off. Um, they talk like the magazine is called long-term living, right? Um, Cheryl Sawyer is from St. John's living. Uh, did you guys know that the VA system, the federal bureaucratic VA nursing home system got their titles changed to living centers long ago? If they can change and use the word living, so could we. Anybody could, right? So just some words of encouragement. I love that. See, um, dessert first is a great picture of putting the living first and the care second. <laughs> I love it. Now, Very here's good. something else I'd love to share, guys. Um, when you were talking about the China cups, uh, Suzanne, yeah. uh, there was a time in our culture change movement where this was kind of a fun thing, where um, some nursing homes invited the people who live there to all have their own coffee mug. <laughs> what a fun idea, everyone. So whether they buy it themselves or you buy some or families bring them in or you go to garage sales, the idea would be, that I have my own mug and it kind of shows something about my personality. Isn't that that's fun? Actually, that's a <laughs> really great idea, Carmen. I'm actually going to take Woo. that one back with me to the community I work at because Do. they, you, I mean, they have nice mugs, but they're all the same. Yeah. They're not exactly. individualized at all. So, yeah. you know, I think that that's a really good, easy one to do. I easy. like that. Fun. That. Thank you. I learned something today. Yeah. They all can go through the dishwasher. It's yeah, all sure good, you know? 
And if one breaks, fine, we'll get another. It's okay. <laughs> well, you know what? That's a really interesting comment because I was at one community and they always had those um, plastic green institutional <laughs> mugs. You know, those ones you see in the hospital that are really awful and stained and stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, why do we have these mugs? Because they're really ugly and yeah. that sort of thing. And they're like, oh, because our, <laughs> our residents, you know, they will break them oh my if gosh. they're not. And I'm like, really? Because I'm not really hearing lots of coffee mugs falling on the floor. Like I'm just not. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe we need to um, question the status quo and yes. again, make it more yeah. individualized. Yeah. The other thing I want to um, idea that I had that I just thought of is encouraging your um, food service team to wear fun aprons too. Like I know I talked about looking professional and that sort of thing, but you know, even um, with some of our residents that can put on a nice apron or a flowery apron or something that has a fun saying on it yeah. and going around and helping serve desserts or yeah. whatever, that might yeah. be a fun way to get them oh, involved too. Great so, idea, Suzanne. Yeah. Okay, guys, here's what I've learned. That we think that older people can't, can't hold a heavier mug and maybe some can't, of course. But it doesn't mean you couldn't do it anyway, or some people have this mug and some people have that mug. I've also learned that the, like, um, <clears throat> I guess like a, somebody help me. I want to say like a <laughs> light China, China cups can be light, right? So if you need some things to be lighter for some people, fine. But if someone can handle like a, a thicker glass mug, oh, just think of the choices you could give people. And yeah. could we just say out loud, coffee does not taste good in a plastic mug. I would be so mad if I lived in a nursing home and that's all they had. Woo, mad. And at the Brittany. very base of all of that, there is no self-serving adult who enjoys coffee who is going to willingly chuck a mug. Right. We hug it like it's life. <laughs> right, right, that's right, life. Back to life, Brittany, right on. Okay. <laughs> Eric is asking if the session is being recorded. Yes, he would like to. Yes, Eric, go for it, Eric. And yes. Oh, yes. And why don't I do an advertisement right here while Eric's helping me remember? So everyone, um, you know, every Tuesday is a big conference session like today, and so next Tuesday is Lacey Corneliuson talking about more and more team member engagement ideas. Are you paused, Carmen? And I want to announce that the learning circle has come up three times by three separate speakers. I didn't plan that. And that hopefully that really speaks well to all of you about the learning circle to maybe try it and start to see what people are talking about. And um, this week now, the rest of the week, we have three special sessions. So what we mean by a special session, I, I love explaining this to everyone, it, it kind of was born out of an idea to try a happy hour, <laughs> kind of something special or a little bit low key. Um, but of course we're not in person. And then of course we can't do it at five when everyone's going home. So it's at 2 p.m. every time we have one. And they're basically special sessions now, basically per discipline. So tomorrow, uh, everything's always at 2 p.m. Mountain time tomorrow is a special session for activities, recreation, life enhancement teams. Uh, then Thursday is a special session for social service teams. Friday is this topic, dining. So, you know, and if some of your team members couldn't join us today, have them come Friday and I'm sure a lot of us will come back up. Thanks to you, Suzanne. <laughs> mm, <good. laughs> well, I wanted to like, just really wanted to encourage all of you um, the fact that you came to the webinar and even if you got one or two nuggets from this session and that you can apply it and think twice about what you're doing, um, you are heading in the right direction. So Rome was not built in a day. So, you know, maybe just take one or two things, work on it and try something else. But I want to really encourage you to think about the dining experience as being everybody's responsibility, not just food service show up in the dining room, get the leadership team involved, get your learning circle, start talking to each other and things will just bubble up to the surface as to what needs to be done. And if you can see it as their home 
and that we are there to allow for self-determination with all things, um, then you're on the right path. So, um, you know, be awesome. And uh, just really want to encourage you all. Thank you for coming today. And I hope you learned something. <laughs> we did. We learned a lot, Suzanne. By the way, self-determination is not just a good idea. It's a regulation, ah, right? Something to, to elevate it, everyone. And I love how you said bubble up, Suzanne. Uh, Eric, you, you asked this great question. How do I just get rolling and moving with my dining team, even though I don't know that much about it? I want to invite all of you, when you ask team members what their dreams are or their wishes are for this dining experience, for their job even, for the people they serve, guess what? All these ideas are somewhere in people's hearts. They do wish for different, you know, and boom, there it is. So it does bubble up. Thank you, Suzanne. All right, Suzanne, Cheryl's saying thanks so much, informative and engaging. Welcome. Thank you, Cheryl. Welcome. Yeah. Thank yep. you for having me. For me too, Suzanne. I highly admire you. Love your passion, your practicalness. Thank you. Thank you so much. God Welcome. bless you. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank All right. You. Thanks, everyone. We'll say goodbye. <laughs>